All right, guys, another episode. We are ready to go. So before I get into this week's episode, I want to make a few announcements, let you know what's going on in the rehab Cairo world. So we are really, really deep into our mastermind members who are now taking the next step. So just so you get an idea, a lot of our founding members of the mastermind program joined last summer. So we're coming up on a year in the program. And I mentioned this a few times, but step one, typically when we get a business that's already started is to fix the internal systems. How can we create a pricing structure, figure out how to sell, create packages, give a better customer experience so we can increase revenue. And after three, six, nine, 12 months, we get that under control. And now, now we're ready to grow. And so many of my mastermind members are now in a position to start hiring. And so we're starting to get to that point of hiring, leadership, mentorship, um, specifically for that client care, admin, sales type position. A lot of my members are in that position now. So we are in the throes of teaching how to interview, how to hire, how to not let that dreaded schedule an interview and have no one show up happen because there is a way to make sure that that doesn't happen. We teach that as well. Also, September 10th and 11th, September 10th and 11th, we are having our first in-person big event, Rehab Cairo Mastermind. 10th and 11th here in Bridgewater, New Jersey. So for you guys that don't know New Jersey, we're, it's a 25-minute easy Uber ride from Newark Airport. As of this recording, I have two guest spots left. So this mastermind is predominantly for my mastermind members. You know, this is part of the tuition that they pay. But right now, because I'm still trying to grow this community, I am opening it up to guests. I've sold quite a few guest passes already, and I have two spots available. So if you've listened to the podcast, you aren't really involved in our world, but want one of those guest passes, please just shoot me an email, coaching at strive to move.com or send me a message on Instagram. I'm pretty good about getting back to people. So we have two spots remaining with that to give you a little bit of an idea of what's going to happen in that weekend. So that first weekend is going to be a sales and marketing masterclass. So if you wonder how to get new patients, how to set up a marketing schedule, how to do the right messaging, how to send emails, we are going to go through all of that on the marketing front. We're also going to talk sales. Out of anything we train in our business, the biggest thing we train is sales. So if you are a cash-based practice out of network or even in network, and you don't understand the sales process, you are going to struggle. Like I said, we have a culture of sales in our business because we know the only way we can help people is if they're in our office. And we also have empathy to understand that typically when you're a cash practice, you're more expensive than the guy down the street. So if you don't know how to sell that to people, you're going to be you're going to struggle you're going to struggle so embracing that you can do it and you can do sales in a non sleazy good way and you can take it and implement it into your practice that monday morning so again that's september 10th and 11th i think it's going to be an amazing weekend i i would put my life on it that you could not Uh, ask for two more days, better days that are going to help grow yourself and your business, the connections you're going to make in during lunch at the bar after. um, Those are the times. That's what you can't get. That's what we missed over the last few years with COVID. So we are going to do that September 10th and 11th. If you want one of those guest passes, please shoot me a note. Um, We are, as of this recording, about to be, we are just through week six of our intro course, everything you should have learned in Cairo school. And again, you know, I'm just super excited myself and Dr. Jeremy Dinkin, who's been a guest on the pod. We've been running this course and the feedback's been absolutely amazing. And just to give you an idea of how we've run this course, um, week one has been all, it was all about mindset, getting your mind right. Week two was all about sales. Like I said, sales and communication in a cash-based practice to run a rehab style practice, uh, vital. Week three, week three is marketing. Week three is marketing. We have to make sure that we get people in the door and that when we get them in the door, then we can sell to them. So sales and marketing. Week four, I actually had a guest on, James Pratt, who owns Pratt Performance, uh, right across the street from our office. And he's grown a business from 50, 60,000 to over a million in five or six years. No, that is not an exaggeration. That is true. 
And so he gave us some amazing insights into the relationship between a clinician and a gym owner about his journey of going from basically solo practitioner, essentially, to you know being a personal trainer, to growing and scaling his business with staff. Um, and there's some, with some amazing insights that I've never actually heard any coach trainer talk more candidly about that relationship that, um, that, that is there, the good and the bad and the ugly, so to speak. Um, week five, week five is all about finance, KPIs, prices,ing and packaging, prices and packaging. And so we went through in detail, very, very dense material about budgets, KPIs, forecasting, leading and lagging indicators to give our uh, students in that course, just a baseline of what to do. Week six, back into sales. Back into sales. Again, the lifeblood of your clinic is making sure that you can help to get someone across the line so that you can teach them. Next week, the final week, will be our, will be our conclusion. It will be a wrap-up um, and making sure we can tie all of the pieces together. Now, today's episode. Today's episode, if you guys are out there, potentially either in school, just graduated, or want to develop an athlete in sports niche, this podcast is probably the most valuable 45 minutes you will have uh, in the next month. So one of my friends, Dr. Natty Bandesack, is a performance PT. And so as you guys know, as a rehab chiro performance PT, literally the only difference is the letters after our names. And so Natty does what so many of us would love to do. His practice is about, and he goes through this, is about 10% professional athletes and then 75% middle high school college athletes. Now, you'll hear me open up this podcast. And what I say to Natty is, um, Natty, when people ask me about building a sports-based practice, the first thing that I say is don't do it for a variety of reasons. I have you here so you can prove me wrong. Why am I wrong? Because I think this is amazing. Like I love to get people on that have done it differently than me, might think of it differently than me, and have uh, a successful business, but in a little, a little different twist. My job at times is just to curate the content, is to bring people in that can give different perspectives. I'll never tell anyone what to do. I just want to give people options. So Dr. Natty, uh, he's been in practice. He's grown it immensely since he started. He has two locations. He's here in New Jersey. Uh, just a great guy. And um, he's been able to step away from his practice for a period of time, being able to travel. He's built such a great niche. And so if you're not following him, his practice, Myokinetics, we talk about it in the practice. He just published a book about ACLs. So there's so much here. Like, again, super valuable. You're going to get a ton out of this podcast. And I'm so excited and honored that he came on. So I hope you enjoy. What's up, everyone? Welcome to the business school for the rehab chiropractor. Class is officially in session. My name is Justin Rabinowitz, and I am a rehab chiropractor on a mission to teach you, a fellow rehab chiropractor, the exact tools and systems I've used to build my own successful rehab chiropractic practice so you can do the same. I hope you enjoy, and please subscribe. All right, Natty, let's get right into it. Um, You, as a performance PT, as we say, you're doing exactly what us as rehab chiros are doing. You just have different letters after your name. But the number one question that I get as a coach now for students um, and new grads is that they want to treat athletes. They want to work with athletes, high school, college, professional. And basically what I say is, yeah, that's cool, but nah, probably not a good business model. But what looks like on Instagram, I don't know. We'll see what you say. I literally don't know the answer. It looks like you've built a practice and a business being able to work with high school, college, and professional athletes. So mm-hmm. tell me why I'm wrong and you've done it. So I don't think you're wrong. Um, so just to backtrack, like maybe 10% of our population are pro athletes. Um, so I don't go chase after the pro athlete. Right. I think what I created is the environment and the reputation by working with college and high school athletes really well, networking with the coaches, uh, strength coaches, precision coaches, uh, to the point where they are attracted to to me and my practice. Right. They uh, the one thing that you guys uh, people need to understand working with a poor athlete in general is that they have unlimited resources. Right. It's like if you're a guy, you're, you're going down the street, you're trying to talk to like a supermodel, like. She has tons of options. Pro athlete does the same way. They have vast option available to them. If anything is overwhelming at that point. So how they make that decision is based on who they trust and who they know. And fortunately for me, I was able to do good work with, you know, middle school, high school athletes, get them well to the point where I build trust with 
the circle that these pro athletes are involved. And then my name get mentioned. There's time when my name was mentioned 10 times and no one reached out, but the 11, 12 times, that's when they reach out. And it's, it's a slow progress. Like I have someone who would just follow me on Instagram and I say, Hey man, thanks for following me. And they would say, Hey, I, I heard you're the guy. I was like, well, if you need any help, let me know. Nothing mm-hmm. happened a year later. Hey, I'm in town. Can you, can I come see you real quick? And it's all always happened like that. And you have to make time for it because again, um, it, it's good and bad, right? Because once they want something, they want it right then and there. So, you know, I'm at the point now where I used to go in on Saturday and Sunday, see my pro guys. Now they kind of know like when I'm available, if not, they, they go see my, my, my team members, which they're just great. Just as me. Sure. Um, so to answer your question, I don't look for pro athlete. They look for me. And I was able to build that kind of the uh, reputation where people trust me enough to mention my name in front of these guys. Got it. Okay. Excellent. So 10% of the practice is pro guys. Um, let's back up a step because I have people that ask about middle school, high school, college. Mm-hmm. So now start off with rough percentages. How much does the middle high school college athletes make up of your practice? And then talk through that as well. I want to say 65 to 70%. Okay. And like good. So see- let's go into this because I, what I found and what I sort of talk to people about is One of the issues I've found with going to the athlete, the youth athlete, is that they're not the decision maker. And so it's Mm -hmm. like, you can't really market. I found, again, tell me why I'm wrong. I found that you can't really market to them because they don't, they're not paying. Their parents have the insurance, their parents have the money. And so we felt, we've often felt like going to those people is it just creates a harder process where if we can go to the 50 year old mom, like she's going to make the decision for herself. And so we've just found it to be a much harder process because it's like, okay, maybe the kid's in college and he calls and it's like, oh, like I have to ask my mom. It's like, well, Mm -hmm. like this, this is not a good business model, but again, 60, 70% of your practice talk, walk me through it. What happens? How does this work? Well, a, you're not wrong again. Um, those kids are, cannot make decisions. They're minors. So, um, what we usually do is we, throughout our content, we, we get it exciting enough where people get to say, Oh man, if I were to get hurt, I, this is where I want to be. Right. And to that point, when people come on our website, the, the whole lead, the message and everything else is geared towards parents to make better decisions. So we market to the parents. I mean, you know, like I, I'm, I don't, listen, if you run a candy store, I still have to market to the, to the parents because they're the one paying for the candy. And it, it's, it's the same thing. So what we're trying to do is um, once we get, you know, some middle school, high school kids in, right, they obviously have a big friend group. And what we're trying to do is highlight their success, talk about them, create videos, take pictures, all of this stuff so that they share those content of how hard they work to their peers. And when their peers want to get PT, they realize, like, hey, this is the place to be for us. And, you know, we treat our relationship with the parents really, really well because, you know, we, we want to also work with the parents as well. Right. Good. So for us, we use you now we, we, our ability to help athletes give us the opportunity to help the parents, you know, down the, down the line. Cause if the kids are active, you know, the parents generally are active as well. Got it. Okay, good. So now many of my listeners are either like, getting out of school. So want to get going with their practice or just start in their practice. And so you mentioned website, you know, and we, we know you run paid ads and things of that nature, but let's back up a step. Let's mm-hmm. pretend that you're graduating. You have no money, right? You're not going to do digital marketing to start. And cause you sort of, the thing you said is like, we highlight the athletes once they're in, mm-hmm. but let's assume they're not in yet. Right. So we have a lot of listeners that are like, well, I don't have any athletes to highlight cause I haven't started. Mm-hmm. Walk us through, give us some advice on how to even get started. Where do you go? Who do you market to? Like, again, going back, parents, coaches, kids, influencers, like, how do you do that? So I'll just tell you my story. How I got started is I would just, so I would working a regular, you know, PT job, uh, 12 to eight. That's my shift. Uh, What I would do is I would volunteer my time, right? I, I don't know if this is a new concept, but back in the day, people used to volunteer their time to, uh, to get, connection with other people. Um, so I would volunteer my time doing weekends, camp, football camp, soccer camp, whatever, you name it. I would show up with a table, portable table in my car. I would show up, set up a table, talk to people, talk to the coaches, talk to the, you know, talk to the athletes. Right. And I would just do that. I did it for pretty much a year. 
I would show up after, uh, after my shift, before my shift to work with all these high school athletes. And then the coach would say, Hey, your son got hurt. You got to go see Natty. Um, you know, he's been treating your son here, uh, like before and after practice. Um, I think if you can go see him on your own, we'll, we'll speed up the whole process. And literally that's all I did. I, and and I, I kid you not, I did it for a year. Um, I still, I, I don't do it to that extent because now we have a clinic, but we have kids coming in from us because of those relationships I, I have built. You know, it was okay. just um, camps after camp, just showing up. At some point, again, you want, again, going back, you want your name to keep, you want people to keep mentioning your name. And once they keep hearing that, then it sparks some sort of interest, right? You're not going to show up and you're not going to have the return immediately. Um, the, the success I have today, it was from the work I did two, three years ago. Mm. And I'm just reaping the benefits of it. And that doesn't mean I stopped doing it. I still do it, but not to that extent. Right. right? Yeah. Um, uh, uh, so a couple of things that I want to highlight here. The first one is, uh, and I'd be interested in your clinic now, because I think a lot of people don't connect these dots. A lot of people, you know, in the chiropractic space, um, I think they're more more guilty of this in terms of setting up the clinic to match the type of client you had. The thing that you mentioned that people should not look past is when I worked at a job, potentially it was an athlete job. I don't know. My hours were 12 to eight. Mm -hmm. There's a reason why that happens because if you're catering to a population that is in school and playing sports, like you have to be available when they're available. And mm -hmm. so people, this seems so simple, but it isn't like, I remember I heard this a few years ago. There's a PT clinic down in, I don't even know it was where you were in down the shore. And, and all they do is cater to athletes. And I remember someone saying, oh yeah, my hours on four days a week, 12 to eight. And I was mm -hmm. like, oh my God, I never even thought of that. And it's like, well, yeah, of course that's true. Like how else would you get an athlete population if, you, if, you're, op if you're open, you know, 8.30 to four, sorry, like you're out of that business. Yeah. And so, you know, and again, I think this is where some people potentially don't think about second, third, fourth order consequence. Like, oh, I want to see athletes. Great, okay. You want, you're, there's a chance that let's say you want to have kids and a family. If you build the practice that way, well, something's got to give. Mm -hmm. And so you, you, there's a chance that you might not be able to have both. And again, yeah. no one ever told me this before, but in your case, 12 to eight, 12 to eight, those are, those are tough hours. But if you want to see mm -hmm. athletes, they're not getting out till maybe three, they're in season four, five, six, seven o'clock. And so, mm -hmm. um, have you found that like you need to cater your hours of your clinic to the type of population that you're seeing? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, even right now we, our last patient is at 7 PM and my team knows this. I'm like, listen, man, you want to work with these population? That's what you have to do. You mm -hmm. know, they, they're not going to come, you know, it's, it's not, it's not realistic. Like, you know, if you were to open up like a, a food truck and you want to open it when like, right when the bar is closed, right. Because that's the most, that's where you make most money. I have talked to a PT who started his own practice and he's like, I want to work with athletes, but I also want to be home by five. And I say, well, one, something doesn't add up. <laughs> Got to choose, right? Yeah. You gotta choose. Um, sometime the demands, uh, well, the demand will always supersede your needs, right? So if you want your needs to be met, you got to meet the demand first. Because once you meet the demand, you can create good business and then good business can sustain your, your lifestyle. Right. And then you can get your needs. <laughs> yeah. As, as I teach, um, you know, what you want to do and what your business needs might not be the same thing. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that's fantastic. So the other part that I wanted to pick up on that you just sort of breezed through was like, yeah, I had my normal 40 hour job. And then I worked another X amount of time afterwards, volunteering my time. And so it's funny, people ask me when they first open a practice, um, I do it sort of in jest, but I'm not kidding. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, when I first opened a practice, how do I block my time? I said, okay, well, let's assume you're doing 10 clinical hours a week. They're like, yeah, okay. And then they think I'm going to fill in the other 30. And I was like, <laughs> all right, you're doing 10 clinical hours a week. So it means you have 60 hours left in the week. And so, because they asked me about picking a niche, right? Mm -hmm. Well, so how much, like, should I go for everyone or should I go for picking a niche when I do marketing? And it's like, well, you're going to be seeing patients 10 hours a week. So for 40 hours now, after that, you can pick your niche. And for the other 20, then you could go talk to everybody. Mm -hmm. But again, it's like, 
um, for you, the people see it on Instagram, they see it online, they see all these things. I know the amount of effort and, and energy you put into it, but no one recognizes that behind the scenes, what you, what you have been doing. I mean, for a year, you're working a full-time job and then nights, weekends, mornings, you're mm-hmm. doing volunteer work that you didn't get paid for with the idea that hopefully, hopefully one day, one day it pays off. And so mm-hmm. How do you speak to, I know you do a lot of mentorship and speak to younger clinicians, or how would you speak to my audience coming out of school of, of that idea of, you know, living in that social media world, potentially where we see all the highlights, but like what happens behind the scenes and what have you had to put in? Cause you've had, we haven't really got into it too much, but you how long has your practice been open? Four years. Four years. And within four years, you've, you've done amazing. You've been able to work out pull yourself outside of the clinic. You have multiple clinics, but it's not like you showed up and worked 40 hours for four years and it happens to show, it shows up like this, right? There's a lot that goes into yeah. it. Yeah. No, I mean, you're, you're right. And I, I look at both our audiences the same. They're both clinicians. They want to, you know, I think, again, we got into this field to help people because if we want to make money, first and foremost, this is the wrong field right? You know, go into hedge funds and et cetera, but you could make money. Um, so I, I, I view it as the same. Um, so what, what I did in the past, um, you know, as, as far as like building up audience and all of that stuff, um, I just know that business and relationship are built on genuine interaction and to be able to showcase what you can do to someone in person is far more valuable than what you build online for sauce wise, right? I mean, right now you and I, we can go on Toro, rent out two Lamborghinis, ride around for a day, take a picture and say, yo guys, we made it. And then try to sell some sort of course, right? Which a lot of people are doing that. Um, but the, if, if you want to attract those kind of people, you, you will, you'll get it. But are those the population that you enjoy working with? Like, is that something that's meaningful to you. So my main population when I volunteer my time is I go based on, okay, I want to expose to really good athlete, good coaching, but also a group of people who can't afford my service. So I volunteer my time at Irvington high school. It's inner city. They got nothing. And my first year you know, after being there before I go to work, after work, driving to home game and away games, you know, we're able to send 11 kids to D one full ride. It was unheard of in public school for New Jersey. Right. So that's something I take pride in. Right. Why can I do both? Build, build my brand, get people to know who I am, help other people. Uh, and also like send kids to school at the same time. Like yeah. if I can do all of that, like it, it makes my life so much more meaningful. And three years later, it'll play dividend because guess what? Next year, all these kids after the COVID year, they're on D1. They're going to want to go pro. Some of them pro. And guess where they're going to come in when they come to New Jersey. Right. Right. Yeah. So, uh, awesome. It's, it's funny. You mentioned that about volunteering your time, you know, so many people, especially when you're running a cash practice and charging high fees, they, they hide behind as a practitioner, they hide behind the fact that they just want to help people and they don't Mm want to, and and they, they look at that as not charging them money. Like they kind of correlate the two. And something that I talk about often is listen, You absolutely can help people, but actually by you giving them a discount to the people that can afford it is not actually helping them. If you want to help people, what you have to do is you have to make enough money from the people that can afford it so that you should be able to treat the other people for free. And so- It's funny. And you have a perfect example. So Irvington High School, we both know that's a lower socioeconomic status. Natty, if you went to Irvington High School and said, hey, I'm going to give you a discount, they would be like, I I can't afford your discount. Like this is ridiculous. And so what I always tell people is like, if you want to help somebody, giving them a discount is not the answer. You need to treat them for free. Mm -hmm. That means that you better make money elsewhere because now you have an apartment there that we just talked about. You have a cleaning lady, you have expenses, you have a lot of things that you have to do. And so you can't, you can't work on a discount and then also volunteer and work for free. You have to get paid from the thing you're supposed to get paid for so that you can go and do the thing that you're passionate about and work for free. And you know what? Mm-hmm. If you charge people money, if you charge people money and they pay you and you hate it so much, give it to the people that you're volunteering to because they p- could probably use it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's always been my approach. Like, is I want to help those who can't afford it. I don't want to give them a discount. You know, I, I rather just give my time for free, yeah. literally, than give it at a discount because now we're playing those 
those kind of games, which I don't like. So uh, it, it's a weird thing because you end up losing all the time as, as someone who runs the business, as a provider, right? So how I look at it this way. Um, all right. I, I, this is probably the perfect analogy. If you want to notice how people treat you when you give them discount, go on Groupon, buy some sort of Groupon, show up to that business and see how those people treat you. Because, yeah. you know, the, like people, I mean, they look at you like, dude, you're just some sheep person who just got this on a deal uh, and, and just trying to take advantage of, of my business. Right. So, you know, at, at that point, you might as well just give your time for free and help because it's better to give your time away for free because you walk away feeling so much better about yourself. You know, it, it's just part of, you know, us building better human connection. Right. It gives you right. a better purpose of meaning. Right. People, people always say like, Hey, you know, make enough money and then give it away. That's, that's, that's the best, that's the best part about making money is to, to be able to give it away. Guess what? If you don't have money to give away, give away your time, help people. Right. right. Yeah. I, I love it. I think it's fantastic. Let's go. Um, I want to go granular here. Um, okay. So you and I, we like to stay like very high level, but like, I know when I do my coaching and, and it's good, a lot of times they'll sort of press me on literally like how to do it and what to say. And so the example mm. that I think could be very helpful for my audience is like, let's say you open your, you're just starting out, right? And you know, nobody, you don't have any relationships and you want to treat this population, middle school, high school, college, or whatever the case may be. Like, how do you, how, do, how would you advise someone? Like, how do you just like, what do you do to start? Because literally mm. the question I get and I say like, oh, we got to go make relationships. You know, we got to go, we call it hunting. Like you got to go hunt for relationships. And a lot of times people don't do it. And we say like, hey, what's going on? They're like, I, I just don't know what to do. What do I say? Do I email mm. them? What do I say in the email? Do I show up and knock on their door? Like tactically, if you had to advise someone or you were, if you move to Chicago tomorrow, like how would you actually go about doing it? So if I were to move to Chicago, do it all over again, yeah, now you knew I nobody. Leverage, I, I would leverage social media. I would go okay. and say, hey, what's what's going on? What's popping in Chicago? What's the good place? What's some good coaches that have similar philosophy as me? I'll slide their DM, you know, comment okay. that. Tell me what, talk about that. Because people, okay. you slide into their DMs, comment, like, what will you literally do? Like, what's an example of what you would say or do in that situation? Oh, okay. Um, I would comment, say, hey, love this drill. I can see why you like it. Great progression. And then I would say, just do that number of times. Then I would sign to him like, hey, I'm coming to Chicago. We'd love to connect in person. Can we go grab a coffee? Want to pick your brain on something? Um, you know, seem like I'm going to be opening a, a business here. We'd love to uh, get your insight on, on the market or whatever it is, the population you, you, you treat and you work with. And then from there, I can just go, okay, well, listen, you don't know who I am. You don't know my skill set. Uh, I, I love what you have, uh, you know, on, on, on your social media, what you're teaching. Um, what are you dealing with right now? Do you have any pain? Can I, can I show you what I do? Um, mm -hmm. and my, my spiel is always like, listen, I can talk a big game, but I actually, when, when, when I work on you, when I treat you, you know, that's my brother. So I want you to know that like, I'm, I'm really about it. So I would just okay. start doing it. again, volunteer my time, show them valuable that I can help them get to the next level. If I can help them get better. Um, I can help their clients help get better. Okay. You so know, tell me, and, tell me what happens next. So you do that, you treat the gym owner, let's say mm -hmm. you help him, you develop that relationship, you treated him four to five times. How do you make it now make you money? So I would say, Hey, I, I would love to come set up here. Can I bring my portable table? Um, give me five people that been complaining to you about their pain that hasn't got better. Let, let me assess them. Let me, let, let me talk to them. Let me work with them. Um, and then from there, you know, you, you do your discovery visit, you do whatever it is. And then you just tell them like, Hey, why, why, why don't we work together? You know, you see how, what I can do to help you in, in, in half an hour, you see how I can modify your exercises and you can lift this thing pain free. Right. So imagine if you just see me once a week, not even like twice a week, once a week. And we do this for the next four weeks. I guarantee you'll get to do able to do X, Y, and Z. You'll be do, able to do this and that just kind of bridge the gap. Okay. But you know, this is, this is literally my path. That's what I did at CrossFit Roseland to get my, my business started. I would show yeah. up again. So from volunteering my time at the high school, I would show up and take classes at CrossFit Roseland, 
um, volunteer my time to help screen people. And my whole thing to, to gym owners or any other business owners, like, how can I help your business win? Because it's not about my business. My business is inside their business. So that's the foundation of my business. If their business crumble, my business will also crumble. So my approach is like, how do I help you win? Hey, what's your attrition rate? Oh, great. Why do people drop off? How many percent is based on doctors say, stop doing this and that. And you're like, all right, great. Hey, I have a feeling that if I'm here twice a week, I can drop that down 10%. Mm -hmm. Like how, what would your, what would your revenue look like monthly if I decrease that by 10%? And you do the math and you're just like, oh shit, it's a lot of money. So like, so if you let me come in here and I'll pay for, for the space because I don't want, I don't like barter relationship either. Just like discount prices. Right. I want to pay to be there so I can be treated as a professional. And I also want to help them win. So they make extra money. They make, uh, they, they decrease their attrition rate and they get to make more money at the end of the year because of that. Why would they say no? Yeah. Good. Good. I mean, you're, you're, you're actually trying to sell yourself a little bit, but in a good way by, in, by you selling it, you're showing the value to them, which are all like, it's just, as we call it, logical selling. It's very mm -hmm. a logical thing, you know, logical thing to speak in those terms. So that was, that was excellent. And I, I, as you're talking, I'm like, I know that this podcast is going to do great because a lot of the blanks that people have when they're just getting started or trying to get into these populations, they literally, it's like, well, how, what do I actually say? And, you know, and again, you and I sort of, it's one of those things where we sort of breeze over that type of thing, like mm -hmm. the details of it. And what I've realized is actually really a good exercise to almost put us ourselves back in those situations. Oh, like, what would I say type of thing? So yeah. it's really, really good. Um, I and I do to, this all the yeah. time, man. I was in Greece, um, yeah, go. which is really terrible e economically. Yeah. And every time I travel to a new country, I say, okay, if I get dropped off here, how do I become successful? And I'm like, how do I start? How do I what do is, this? What and did you come up with in Greece? So in Greece, obviously there's no middle class and everything, like one third population work for the government, right? Yeah. So now I got to go grease some oil Talk to those people, sweet talk some people who works in the government to get me some good, good connects, right? And because you want to, everything is status. I think you and I can can talk about this too. So, if your name is being associated with people with higher status that can afford your service, then you're in that circle. So my whole point now, just breaking it down, is like how do I show up as a nobody and then slowly work my way up the rank. So I can be associated with people with those high status who A, can afford my services, right? Mm. And then if those people can afford my services, then I can build a, a pretty good business and then I can give it back mm -hmm. to people who can't afford my service. Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it's like you want to build, you know, you, I always have a vision to have like a, a nonprofit to, to, mm -hmm. to give back to, you know, inner city, uh, it, it could money and time, uh, vice versa. But in order to do that, you have to be successful. Yeah. You know, and yeah. And that, that, that was my, uh, that was my thought when I was in Greece. I was like, I yeah. gotta find it. It's all about right connection, right yeah. people. Um, and you know, I, it could be scary and I, I'll tell you what, I got turned down so many times. Yeah. Um, I went to like 20 gyms. Um, I was interviewing them as they were interviewing me. And luckily for me at Crossroads Roseland, the owner, Joe, was very business savvy. He was all about it. And when we start talking numbers, KPIs and all of that stuff, he gets it. And I, and I get it because that was my background um, was in, in the CrossFit world. And as you can see, it's actually talking about niching for a second. My, the beginning of my niche was all CrossFit athletes. And then you can see, I kind of niche my way out of CrossFit athletes to mm -hmm. into ACL. So I think whatever you think your niche is going to be, you have to keep, and an open mind for possibility of where it's going to take you. Right. Cause you, you don't know what you don't know. Right. So how, for me, it's like, once I start seeing more ACL stuff, I was like, dude, Ashley, I love this. Like, I, I remember one of my kids towards ACL. I was thinking, I was up all night thinking about it. How can I get, help him get better game planning and everything. And that was, that was an eye opening experience for me because I say, all right, I, I care so much about this population that I'm losing sleep over it. 
therefore this must be meaningful to me in, in, in some sense. Sure. Yeah. No, I think it's, I think it's, it's an awesome point um, that you're, that you're talking through. So again, tactile conversation, I'm actually interested because part of my frustration that of why we don't do it is because I don't think I have the answer, but literally what happens when um, a high school or college athlete calls to make an appointment with you guys and you say, Hey, and you tell them the deal, we're out of network. Like, how, how does that conversation go? Do you have to say, Hey, we have to call your mom back? Like, how does that even work in your practice? Like, how do I, if I was going to coach my team on what to do, what would I tell them? So you, you obviously listen to this story first. The kids As story. you should. Yeah. Yeah. And okay. just say, Hey, what works? What doesn't work? And then from there, you just say, Hey, when is the best time to have another conversation with your parents? In, uh, involved. So that way we can kind of explain everything. We want everyone to, to, to be together. And we do the same thing for active adult, right? Who's this decision maker in your household? Can we get them on the phone together? Mm-hmm. So that way you guys can make informed decision, right? Yeah. And the way I coach my staff is that the point is not to make any sales or convince them to sign up right then and there. The point is, how do we get to the next phone call? Yeah. Then how do we get to the next phone call? How do we keep going? To the point where like, all right, we talked to you 10 times already. You guys are a good option for us. We know it's expensive. Here's how we'll, we'll make it work. So you, uh, if you get a college kid that's home for the summer and they call June 15th, will you not bring them into your office until you speak to a parent? Well, if they are, if they need help financially to make decision, then yes, we, we would want, we believe in transparency. Mm-hmm. So we want people to make good decisions. So mm-hmm. if, if making good decisions mean delaying them from coming in, absolutely. Okay, good. I think this is so helpful. I, I know it seems silly, but I promise you people are going to be like, thank, like this is really helpful because the first time I get a kid that calls, what the heck do I say to them? How does this even work? You know? No, and, and, and it's good for me to talk it through because these are timeless principles. Yeah. These are that we have to, again, when you get to a certain point, you just keep doing the boring, hard stuff over and over and over again and you don't get fancy. Right. Um, with, with, with anything different, um, right. you know, and just talking it through with you, I'm like, Oh shit. Yeah. I can probably go tell my team a little bit more on that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, it's an interesting, it's an interesting sort of paradigm and, and paradox. I want to go into, you mentioned social media and your website and, and again, this is, I'm interested to hear the answer. Cause I don't think me personally, if I observe my own skill set, I don't think I have the eye or I don't know exactly what it is, but I know certain people and you are one of them that very much the aesthetic, maybe the ver- the words you use or your process behind your social media and your website, I can tell very much who it's for. And so you built the feeling. I don't know how to describe it. It's the the culture of your social media and your website, your digital presence is a kind of the cool, like this would be, if I was a high school or college athlete, I'd be like, all right, that's where I need to be. Is mm-hmm. that, is there, a, is that something consciously that like, okay, we have to do it this way because of this, or it just sort of comes naturally to you of, of the look and the aesthetic and what you say and how, how that works? Well, it's, it's definitely a conscious effort and it's something that will constantly keep making it better and better. Um, yeah. I just know that with the, so like your environment dictates your, your, your outcome, your result. Right. So what we want is we, you know, Starbucks does it best when they say like that first sip feeling, like you don't know what it is, but you know, it's the best feeling when you get like a nice coffee. And for me is, you know, when someone opened the door and they see pro jerseys on the wall, right. They, they walk into a hallway, kind of like a tunnel, every single big sport facility has some sort of tunnel. They walk in and it's going to an open format of, of our clinic in a way. And I, I like it that way because it's, it's, it will simulate what they would go through if they were to go to Division One school. And mm-hmm. every kid have that kind of dreams, right? And, and that's the whole point is that when they walk in, I want them to feel like they're getting treated by the best. They're in the best environment. We have the best equipment, everything that we put in. The whole point is to make sure like, they're here to work and they're here to be the best version of themselves. Um, that was always a long vision, right? Obviously, before that, I was in a closet with, mm-hmm. uh, with, with um, a, a portable table, right? And I just knew that 
I, I, I can mimic that feeling that I have yet, but when I get people on the table, when they work with me, that's what I'm working on is, is working on, you know, like showing them like, Hey, you know, well, this is where you are right now. At the end, you're going to be over here. And I always tell them like, listen, man, once you get to college, you get all the bills and whistle, but what you're not going to get is the attention you're getting with me right now. Right. Like, yeah. you're, no, like I'm, I'm here to serve you where most people will serve the, the team. And um, I think it's go cool. like, so this aesthetic component of the, of the facility and social media, but the in-person interaction, I think that's where if you take it all away, I, I think, will be successful as a company because the genuine interaction that we have with the person in front of us. I think that's amazing. Um, I love what you just said and how we sort of got back to the, to the main point, because again, one of the problems with what you, and I, I hear it, right? Some people come to me and they literally normally a lot, Oh, I'm in a gym. I can't charge these prices because I don't have all the bells and whistles. I don't think I can be cash because I don't have all the best equipment and I don't do this and do that. And I think you hit it perfectly on the head and saying like, we got there. Like that's where we, cause that's what these people want and need, but we didn't start mm -hmm. there. And the reality is we could have all of that stuff, but if we didn't do the other things, well, the in-person interaction, how we made people feel the things that are more intangible, we never would have been able to get to the next step. And I think it probably was a Hormozy quote of saying that the, the big, the big secret, so to speak, like multiple streams of income, no one talks about how in order to get rich, it's usually with one thing. And so we mm -hmm. look at, oh, every millionaire has seven streams of income. It's like, well, but they didn't become a millionaire with seven streams of income. They did <laughs> one thing. And in your situation, the false belief would be that I need, I need to have this bells and whistle facility, the best equipment in order to treat this population. But the reality is that isn't actually how you got there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we raised prices in the middle of the, uh, of the pandemic because we need to, to do so in order to build the facility with the bill and vessel, right? right? So I didn't have it, but the vision is to have it. And how would I make that vision complete? I would need to, you know, show value, keep getting people better, but I also need to charge what, what, what I'm worth yeah. at, at the same time, you know, and my team knows this, that the, the, the facility, the, the staff, the, the support staff that we have right now, it's all because of what we did during the pandemic as far as raising prices and really just doubling down on what we do. Yeah. Uh, great. I think, um, you know, the last just observation, you mentioned the pandemic and um, it sounds like similar to us that you guys had, you know, probably your biggest growth when the world was ending, so to speak. And so yeah, as we're we recording like this- 150%. We, we grew 37% in COVID year, right? And so after, and we were established already, we were in business for five years almost at that time. And so, you know, I think human nature, you know, this is, it's, it's July 21st, 2022. Everyone and their sister is talking about recession and what's mm -hmm. going to happen next and crash and, and we're human. So we sort of think like, oh shit, what's worst case scenario. Mm -hmm. But as I look back on it, and I think about the future and it's a message that I try to obviously tell my team, myself, and then my clients is if I look back, there should be a piece of me that's saying, I hope shit does hit the fan because last time it happened, I mean, we did amazing, right? We did amazing. Like, because you know what? Because everyone else, the normal, the 85, 90% of people would cave and they would go mm -hmm. away, but there will always be people that are going to have the most success when times get tough. And so it sounds yeah. like that was you. It was definitely our business. And people ask me about my team and, um, and our business. And, and I always tell them, one of the reasons why I'm so bullish on, on us and my team as people is because I never saw anyone. I, we, we did the best we ever did when shit got hard. And mm -hmm. so yeah. why should I shy away from that? Like we've done so well during it. It's almost at some point I kind of joke with them, but I'm not. It's like, this is too, right now it's too good. Yeah. You know, it's too good. I got to make it harder because last time this happened, everyone did amazing. Mm -hmm. And and the economy is something you have no control over. Like, I mean, I was talking to a, a friend of mine, Jerry, um, yeah. who has his practice for, you know, 10 years now. And during the 08, 
um, uh, you know, the housing market bubble, the crash and everything else. I graduated high school in 07, 08, just living in like in my family. We, we just live in like a two bedroom apartment and I was working like three jobs, going to community college. By that point, I was just poor. So <laughs> nothing changed for me. Circumstances were the same. And I, yeah. I was telling Jerry, I was like, Jerry, you got to walk me through what happened. How bad was it? And he was like, why do you not remember? I was like, dude, nothing changed for me. I was poor. I had no money then. The, the market crashed. I still has no money. So it's the same thing. Um, yeah. So that, that's, I think that's how I approach it is, um, is, all right, I made it far back then. I had nothing, right? Um, and I think what's good about building your own business and, and starting from scratch is that you can always say to yourself, like, I built this to this point. If something were to happen, I would know how to do it again. And I like playing those games where, again, putting myself in Greece, what would be, you know, like if the government's super corrupt, how would I thrive in this kind of environment? What do I have to do to think differently? Clearly, there's some people who have made it. How do they make it? And um, like right now, I'm reading that book, Titans, uh, that's talking about like, you know, John D. Rockefeller, how he made his fortune during the Great Depression. I mean, yeah, you know, so yeah. I, I, I don't read anything that um, will give me excuses. Yeah. I, I would read stuff that give me hope. Good. I love it. All right. So now for my, my listeners out there, I think there's a lot here that they can model. And I think oftentimes I've found, yes, listening to you talk is great, but watching what you do, I think could be a, a big success for them. Um, you are a published author. You have a local podcast. So let's talk through Let's, let's plug those. What was the impetus behind the book? Give us the name. Um, and again, it's a, it's a book on ACL and I would encourage my clinicians out there. Sure. I'm sure you'll learn some good stuff about ACL, but really observe why Natty did it. Not the information in the book is probably not even for them as much of just seeing the format. Here's why I did it. What was the reason behind writing the book? Mm -hmm. So the book was written for coaches, parents, and athletes to understand huge point, ACL. huge point. Yeah. Um, it, 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 I'm not here to cater to, to the, the medical community. When I was writing that, I was just here to, I was here to shed some light on like, this is a long road. You have 12 months. Here's what it's going to look like. And then from there, all I did was it just show credibility of like, Hey, you know, I, I know enough to write about this and I can help you go through this. And I'm not literally just taking all medical jargon and then just simplify things for them to understand. Um, and, you know, and with, with the book, uh, it gave me an opportunity to get connected with people who like all over the world, just talking about like, Hey, I'm going through ACL. I love your book. Uh, you know, the exercise you have, and I'm just trying to keep it as simple as possible. Cause if you know about something, you should be able to make it as simple as possible. Right. Uh, I think, where we get lost is if you model, uh, if you're looking at other clinician and, and try to model his success and you go based on someone who has uh, a mentorship course who's selling things of like how to treat patients better and they make things super complicated, you tend to want to do that to your patient, but your patient don't want that. Right. You know, why do you think Google exists? Google exists to give you a simple answer, not to get more confused. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Got it. You know, Good. so that What's was always my, 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 my process. And it's, it's a lead magnet. Uh, it gave me a, a platform to go into doctor offices hmm. to bring them a stack of books, you know, and it, it's, it's great, man, because when you go into doctor offices, I, I still keep really in good contact with good physician that, um, see eye to eye with me. Um, and it's just cool that you see all the other big company with their cards regional director, whoever it is. I just walked in with like 10, 10 books and I just put it there. Mm -hmm. Love it. You What's know, the name and, of the book? Uh, the complete guide to ACL rehab. And, Available on Amazon, right? Yep. On Amazon. Um, and, and all, all, you know, whatever Kindle, whatever you want to buy it. Um, if you're looking to buy this book, what I would suggest is just look at the, the language I use. Um, you know, I write for like, you know, fifth grade reading level, very digestible. Um, yeah. Also take a look at the exercise library uh, because that's the, a, a lead magnet within itself. Um, Got it. 
you know, you, you pay $29 for, for the book, but the content you get is wealth over $29. Sure. Yeah. You know, and, and again, I think from our, for our audience, they're clinicians. This just hopefully gives them ideas because, um, you know, we can't fix lazy, right? Mm-hmm. Like if they're lazy and don't want to do the work, we can't help a clinician or a business owner, but there's a lot that aren't lazy, but they just don't know what to do. And so in this mm-hmm. case, yeah, you're right. 30 bucks to learn what Natty did, how to go about doing it. Well, the purpose of was it now, all of a sudden we have some, we have a project that we can really work on and, and put, put into play in whatever niche you've created. The other thing, um, podcast, tell me about the local podcast that you do. Yes. So, uh, I have the myokinetic podcast, which is a podcast I, I do that you know, interview my past patient, uh, you know, some, some coaches that I know this is solely, uh, to, to highlight their success, but also to highlight, um, to connect with other business owners as well that are potential referral sources. Right. So it, it get, give me an opportunity to really talk, talk to them what they're about, give them a chance to come to the office. You know, I give them the tour to the clinic. So it's, it's, it's a win for everybody uh, with that podcast. Uh, I have another podcast coming out this more, Clinician based, uh, uh, I'm calling it badass clinicians, where I get to interview, you know, other business owners who are, you know, PT Kairos that learn to double down on their clinical skill, right? Mm-hmm. Because at the end of the day, you have to be good at what you do mm-hmm. in order to have successful business. And I'm not saying, you know, don't work on your business skill, but you need both. And I think my my whole um, journey has been me doubling down on my clinical skill set. And then whatever money I was spending on Con Ed, I was spending on business. Hmm. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. so I just never stopped spending money to grow my skill set, whether it's business, uh, you know, personal or uh, clinical. Got so it. That's, love it. that's launching soon. Yep. I love it. All right. So tell, tell the audience where they can find you. Tell us your Instagram, your website. Uh, and then so they can look you up and study what you do. Yeah, uh, you know, I'm I'm always on Instagram. I get yelled for it at, every night. So uh, just find me at dr.natty, D-O-C-T-O-R dot N-A-T-T-Y. You can follow my clinic, Myokinetics, M-Y-O-K-I-N-E-T-I-X. And everything is on my my link tree. So you guys can find everything from there. Shoot me a DM if you want to connect. We, I would love to, to chat. And um, Justin, thanks for having me. I would love to have you on my new podcast. I, I think it would be great to, to have that, that discussion. Guys, um, I hope you appreciate this podcast. There's there's about there's about a hundred nuggets in here that can make you a lot of money pretty quickly, and that you answered. I think you really did tactically answer so many of the questions that I get. Um, so I appreciate you being on. And um, guys, you'd be silly out there not to reach out to Natty because he's a wealth of knowledge. He's built his business from scratch and he's created a niche. Everything that a lot of you out there want to do, he's already done and is currently doing. So um, I, I hope you enjoyed this. This was amazing. Thanks, brother. Thank you, man. Pleasure's on mine. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. And if you found this content valuable, here are four ways I can help you for free. One, grab a copy of my free guide, The Rehab Chiropractor's Checklist. You can get that at go.drjustinrabinowitz.com slash guide. That's go.drjustinrabinowitz.com slash guide. Two, go ahead and give me a follow on Instagram at Justin Rabinowitz, where I post business content. Three, subscribe to my weekly newsletter by sending me an email at coaching at strive to move.com. And four, leave us a five-star review so we can gain access to more influential people and bring those lessons back to you.